Welcome back to another episode of Handloader TV. And in this episode, we'll again be continuing our series on World War II small arms. And with me today is my good friend Mike Venturino, the author of Shooting World War II Small Arms. And we've got two 1911s before us here, but they're a little bit different, right, Mike? That's correct. And first, I'd like to say thank you for letting me be a part of this. Oh, it's my pleasure. And also for letting me talk about these fine historic guns. I have learned so much listening to you and talking with you about these things. And you, you've opened mm -hmm. up your home oh. and your your own priceless historical artifacts, really, is what these are. Well, it's been my pleasure. Uh, mine, too. Well, these are 1911s here, 1911A1 there. There's very minor differences in the two of them. The most visual are the... The mainspring housings on a 1911 are flat. See that? Okay, yeah. 1911A1, they're arched, just like that. You can see them in an instant. Also, 1911A1s have the scalloped out finger groove here. Oh, okay. And 1911s don't, the edge of the... Just kind of rounded. Dirt. Yeah, okay. that's right. There's some minor inter interior differences, but they don't amount to a lot. Okay. And as I was telling you earlier before we began, in 1918, when Colt was making 1911s, at the height of their production, they produced 2,000 a day. That is extraordinary. Think about that. 2,000 a day. How many machines did they require with a trained man standing at it, turning out parts? It boggles my imagination. That is. And it kind of shows you... The kind of manpower we were throwing into that war at the time because only NCOs and officers got the 1911s, That's correct? That's right, and they still didn't make enough of them. <laughs> but the 1911s are blued. They have a nice finish on them. About the time they came out with the A1s, or shortly there or after, they began to parkerize them like this. Oh, it's okay. a phosphate finish. That's very durable. Doesn't wear near as much as the blue. Of course, all of these were 19, or 1911s, A1s, and 1911 regulars were 45 ACP. Right. Yeah. And it's fine cartridge. Now, the, this thing was actually designed for the U.S. Cavalry wasn't ah. designed for infantry. And for that reason, it's got three safeties. Mm -hmm. There's the grip safety. If you don't hold it, it doesn't go off. Right. It's got the thumb safety that holds the hammer back. It has to be cocked, hammers back. And then you can pull it like that and then pull the trigger. And also, it's got a half cock notch. Like that. Okay. So you can have three different safeties in one gun. The reason was with a man on a horse and he's handling the gun like this, it's easily repeatable firing. <laughs> you've got the reins in one hand and the gun in the other, so you've got to have something to make sure it just doesn't go off. Right. I, I was friends when I was young with a man who trained in 1942 with the U.S. Cavalry. And he said more than one trooper in their training unit shot his horse in the head. Wow. <laughs> so <laughs> I always wondered what happened to those men. Did they have to pay for the horse? <laughs> that, that is an interesting <laughs> question, yeah. One difference I forgot to point out was the 1911s mostly had wood grips. By World War II, these were plastic. Oh, okay. See, that's another thing you can look for. If they've got wood grips, they're likely a 1911, but they could could be an A1. Well, that's See. very interesting history. A little tidbit being a horseman myself and shooting off horseback and stuff. Yeah. I can appreciate the three safeties on there, you know. Especially. Especially go ahead. Dropping a gun. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like that. For sure. It yeah. can happen. Anything can happen on a horse. Oh, you bet. You <laughs> never know. <laughs> that's right. Uh, the one fault I have with 1911s, of course, I'm getting older, is the sights. Oh, okay. That, Front sight is just a tiny little bead, half round object there. The rear sight is also tiny, the notch is tiny. It, it at least is 
driftable for windage. Mm. There's no way to change elevation in these things. Mm. In fact, I had one that shot a foot high. I sold it. It, it didn't do me much good. I couldn't hit really? anything with it. Later with the, these, they changed the front sight just barely, put a little uh, groove in it there. Uh, the bigger notch back here but still, there's no way to change it for elevation. Hmm. Very uh, interesting. So now when it comes to care for the 1911s, I think there's a few do's and don'ts. And you hear a lot of that talked about by various manufacturers and stuff. Right. Maybe we could get your opinion on well, that. Well, you don't want to store them with the hammer cock. You make the springs go light, maybe. Uh, clean them, you strip it down, field strip it, which is very easy. I won't go into it right here, but it comes apart with no tools, right. just, just a little knowledge. And you can clean the barrel, you can hold the barrel by itself and clean it very well. You can get into the innards with a rag, an oily rag, get them good and clean. And then you can reassemble it in just a minute or so. Right. Yeah, they're pretty simple overall. A mm -hmm. um, lot of individual parts there to take care of, but I mean, it's it's fairly simple. Like you said, no tools, a little thumb pressure on the springs, and you're good to go. And there's a reason why this gun was the official U.S. service sidearm for many, many years, almost 75. Uh, that's a, that is impressive. And that's because it was so darn good. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of talk about uh, what, it, we, what we were just talking earlier about its replacement, you know, and there's a lot of people that, like the 1911 even over like the Beretta and the, yeah. the replacement. Well, I had a Beretta and not to knock them or anything, but to me it was big and awkward. Yeah, yeah. And these are slab sided and handy. Very handy. Yes. Balance yeah. well. And it, it's an iconic firearm. If you think of an American handgun, I mean, the 1911's gotta be in the top 10, if not the top five. Yes, and it rivals the Colt single action for yeah. popularity and world recognition. You show a cult single action in a movie around the world, they know what they're seeing. Right. And probably the same thing with these. My personal problem with them is having a little bit chubby hands is that hammer will bite me and draw blood every time. Oh, yeah. I got to the point, I love to shoot them, but I just go ahead and put a Band-Aid on. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah. Good idea, good workaround. Mm-hmm. So it's an iconic cartridge as well, 45 ACP. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you have a, a favorite load for these guys. I most certainly do. I have more than one. This gun is old, made 1918. I don't want to stress it with a maximum load. Right. And so I found a load on the Hodgson website that trail boss powder at 4.5 grains will shoot this at a 230 grain bullet at about 750 feet per second, wow. which is mild. And I use those with lead bullets just to save wear on this. With these, I want a more powerful load, these more modern guns. And I'll shoot the 5.4 of 231, mm -hmm. either 230 grain cast or 230 grain full metal jacket. And that's more of a, a powerful load. And it's kind of handy having the same load around for submachine guns and these. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. yeah, for sure. Well, what do you say we take these guys to the range and put some rounds down? I've got the rounds, you just gotta carry them. It's a deal to <laughs> me, I'll take that deal any day of the week. You bet. So we're out on the range now, we've got a couple of targets down range at about 20 yards, and we've got the 1911 here. What do you say, Mike? Shall you we shoot first? I you shoot, shoot first? good, I'm not gonna shoot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see how I do. It's been a while, so. Everybody good? Eyes and ears? All right. I got excited. Twice. Well, it's pretty good though. Gun you've never fired before, don't know the trigger pull. I think that's pretty good. I gotta say, that trigger pull on that is pretty nice though. That's good. Now, now you really put the pressure on me. 
Well, I missed twice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jeremiah, here goes nothing. Your turn, let's see it. That's not too bad. Not as good as the kid did, but not too bad for an old guy. <laughs> Pretty good in my book. For an old, oh yeah, see you got the bite too. <laughs> Forgot the Band-Aid. Forgot the Band-Aid. <laughs> for an old gun though, I mean an old design, man, they just, yeah. there is something special about them. They really do work good. John M. Browning knew what he was doing. He That's really all. did, Yeah. he really did. So we're back in the vault now, and we fired 13 different handguns while out on the range for this whole series, and we thought we'd go ahead and talk about all of them at once at the end of each of these videos, but we'll have individual videos talking about each of these firearms you see here on the table, so be sure to keep an eye out for those. And we did a lot of shooting and a lot of testing with these guys, so I don't even know where to start, Mike. What do you think? I know where to start. I'm a red-blooded American, and that Smith & Wesson 45 is my favorite. <laughs> I hit better with it. I felt better with it. Uh, this would be a good second, the 455 Smith & Wesson. Okay. I can tell you which one I like the least. This little Japanese double-action only uh, oddball revolver. <laughs> I'd have to agree with you on that one. I think we actually managed to hit the target once, each of us, but yeah. I think that might have been a little bit of a luck factor. Well, we had rotating paddles, and we both hit them once, but they didn't rotate. <laughs> no, they didn't move very much at all. <laughs> uh, but it, there were some pretty interesting ones, too. Like, I was really surprised. I shot really well with the 1917 uh, Smith & Wesson revolver. Mm -hmm. But then when we swapped over to the Colt, I, I don't know if I even hit one with the Colt. That Smith & Wesson just felt better in my hand compared to the Colt. Well, the people in 1917 must have had bigger hands than me because my hand will not reach that trigger for double action shooting. Uh, I can do it, but just barely. Really? Yeah. The Smith & Wesson, I can handle that easy. That kind of makes sense, because I had trouble with that, too. Reaching mm -hmm. the trigger was tough. I was shooting at single action, and I still couldn't hit anything. Well, so. it's blasphemy, but as usual, the 1911 bit me. Uh -huh. uh, I got a, the wound from it. Uh, they're a wonderful gun, but I have to put a Band-Aid on before I shoot them, and I forgot to do that. <laughs> yeah, I think the 1911 got me, too, That just that little bit longer hammer there compared mm -hmm. to a lot of the more modern 1911s you see today but still overall I really like it and it shot pretty well for me if I remember correctly. The 38 Smith & Wesson we did good with it too. We did we yeah. did very good Both with that. Both of us yes. The Luger that's that was interesting we, we we kept having jams failure to feed failure to eject but we had our elbows on the table and we were limp in the guns then. We shot it just straight away. Everything, all the problems just went away. And you actually brought that point up because we function tested it and we got a new box of ammo and I went out and I shot it with no rest and I said, oh yeah, it functions great. Mm -hmm. And you were the one that told me to pick my elbows up off the table and, and try it. And lo and behold, the Luger functioned just fine then. Just fine then, yeah. So we learned something about that. The Lugers are pretty finicky, but if that gun isn't able to recoil, then mm -hmm. it, it'll jam on you, which is very interesting. Well, that's my conclusion. The French pistol I didn't hit very good with, but I've not shot it very much. It functioned well. Uh, the high power, there's no flies on high power. That, that's a good gun. It is a good gun. I don't uh, think I hit anything with it, but it functioned uh, great, and uh, I know they're good guns. I've shot other ones and done pretty well with them. The, the P-38 is a good gun. I like it. But just give me the revolvers. I'm old. I want revolvers. <laughs> Except for the 1911. Now what about that Nambu over there on the very end? Well, it was just like what we said. The magazine's hard to pull out when it's empty. Then the bolt falls forward. Then you've got to re 
retract the bolt again when you put a new magazine in. It's it's a joke. It is pretty surprising to me that that's what they issued. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, and and as I told you, they issued these with a spare firing pin because they break so much. Yes. Which is very interesting. Yes. Yeah. No wonder they gave their officer swords. And then the Webley, we did okay with that, I think. Mm -hmm. We did. Uh, it's still ugly. <laughs> I don't care how good I could shoot with it. I'd look at that and say, that's ugly. <laughs> uh, but it was a lot of fun. I must admit, I had a blast getting to shoot all these different firearms. We've got tons of other videos on World War II small arms. They're in the works. They'll be edited, and you guys will get to see individual videos on this and all kinds of other stuff. And we, we barely scratch the surface when it comes to information on these things. This is just mm -hmm. a real small tidbit. So make sure you guys go ahead and check out Mike's book, Shooting World War II Small Arms, and you can learn about each one of these individually, all the loads you've put mm -hmm. through it and all that mm -hmm. stuff. So, Mike, i got to thank you very much for letting us come out here and shoot your wonderful collection. It's been a, a dream come true for me. You'll always be welcome here, Jeremiah. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Mm. And then I'd also like to thank Ted Tompkins. He's our official gopher. He was driving around spray painting targets for us and grabbing the guns we needed and the ammunition and just even the food, whatever else we need. So well, a he, special thanks for Ted. He was too ugly. We didn't put him in front of the camera. We couldn't put him in front of the camera. <laughs> We tried, we tried a couple times, but it didn't work. No, he ran every time we he, got the he camera. He ran. Yeah. He knew better. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd also like to thank Chris Downs and Don Polichek for making this all possible. Chris is the cameraman. He does all the great angles and shots you see. And then Don Polichek, he's the owner of Wolf Publishing and the director. So thank you guys for watching this video. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope you saw it for what it was. Two guys teaching each other how to, well, Mike's teaching me how all about these guns and how to shoot, and we just had a whole lot of fun doing this. Yeah. So, thank you for watching. We hope if you like this video, you give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell icon so you're notified when we post our next video, because you won't want to miss out on this series. And as always, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave those in the comment section below, and I'll do my best to respond to each one of those. Thanks, and we'll catch you in the next episode. Thank mm -hmm. you.